that help us in mapping x to y, right? And y used to be the real number, right? That's 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 what we call the regression. And x basically had the dimension. When we want to talk about classification, the idea is that the main change that we have is that y is no longer a real number and it has k dimensions. Okay. Or, or better way in saying it, y belongs to y1 to yk. Now, what are those k? Is that imagine you want to solve a problem, uh, create a model that predicts or classifies breeds of the breeds of a dog, you know, and all the breeds that you have, those are going to be this yk. Now, k, this k are unique. That means that you know, if you look at your data set and you have one million records, and you look at the column y, and you see you have ten unique uh, category then you have 10 10 is ca uh, case 10 so it, it's not uh, we don't have one per data for basically you have limited number of k now so anytime that you try to solve this same problem but y is no longer a real number and is one of this k category that becomes a classification problem now uh, if Y is more than two, we call it multi label classification. If Y is two, basically, uh, we call it binary. For this class, majority of the time, we are dealing with the binary classification. Okay. Uh, otherwise, we'll, I will specify that if it's not binary. So, anytime I write a classification algorithm, it's by default a binary classification. Okay. If it's multi class, I will write this multi class. Because majority of the algorithms, classification algorithm that we have, you cannot use more than two, more than binary. They are not solving it for you. Okay. So by default, it's always binary what we are solving. Now, um, previously, okay, we in regression we said h theta x, and we find that that what we call theta transpose x, right? In regression, that gives us a prediction value, and we call this. Um, either we call it let's say y hat, or we can say that almost y, right? We, we wanted to make that prediction. But classification, that's no longer the same uh, because when you have a data point and you want to say that, okay, uh, which class this data point belongs to, you know, that question is no longer a uh, sharp, like a straight answer like this. They cannot, here we just say that this is a Right, this is the information for a house. What is the price? You know, it's straightforward. But in the classification, you cannot write the formula in this form anymore. You have a feature input. You should say the way that we formulate is that what is the chance? Okay, it's like a probability. What is the probability this data belongs to a cat? What's this probability? This, you know, it's a dog. So the formula, the formula becomes like this. What is the probability? of y being k, you know, this data point belongs to class k, it could be anything, given this input. That's what we want to formulate in classification, okay? Now, in um, regression, when we had a data set, x1, y1, all the way to xn, yn, and we would have said that the probability of that data set basically was multiplication of um, probability of basically each individual, right? X1 and Y1, right? In classification, we don't say that also. We are basically, uh, when we have a data set, so let's, let me first phrase something. So when we want to create a classification model, you always, there's something is important for you, you want to solve. You know, when you, when you do regression, price of the house is something that's important. You want to be able to predict it correctly. In classification, uh, if you have a, a model that is, is going to detect a specific disease, you know, all you care about is the disease prediction, not the other way around, right? So 
uh, when we're dealing with the binary classification, we first need to point out to one thing, uh, class one and class zero. Okay, all binary problems, except for support vector machine we will see later, they have this formulation, one versus zero. Class one is called class of interest. Okay. And class zero is the other class, basically. Class of interest is what you want to solve. What is the, the whole uh, goal of developing this model for you is to be able to detect this, not that one. That's not important. So, because this is what is important for us, when we want to formulate it, we focus on this. You know, like what, what does it mean that is that if we have this data set, this data set, each input could have either class zero or class one. Okay. And when we want to formulate this, we will say what is the probability of y given x. Okay. We are not going to just leave it like that. We actually will say what is the probability of y being class one. So in the regression, we simply multiplied all the individual probabilities, right? Probability of x1, y1 times probability of x1, x2, y2 times times, right? In here, we also do the same thing. Yeah, IID, we do multiplication, but we are not. So, you know, another way of writing this could be like this. What was, what's the probability of y given x if we didn't care about the class, right? What is the probability of this target value given this input? But that's not the way we want to solve it. What we care about is what is the probability of being class one given some input. So all the all the problems, algorithms in classification, when we want to formulate, except again for support vector machine, we will talk about. We always formulate with respect to class one. Okay, and you know the, the, the reason for that is that just if you solve it with respect to class one, this is a probability. So class zero becomes one minus class one, right? So but this is what we want to learn. Now, again, remember, so any pro any time you also have a data set, if your data set is category, you need to do some sort of encoding to zero and one. Now, there are two main types of classification. First one is called discriminative, and the other one called generative. There are two main types of classification, discriminative classification, generative classification. Now, the both of these we are trying to solve for this equation. What is the probability of y being um, something, even x? The reason I put K rather than one, because this is the same formula for multi-level classification also, so K for now. But in both scenario, we are trying to solve this equation. Now, let's take a look at here. This is X1 and this is Y. And this was a regression problem, right? Your goal was to find that line. Correct? That goes through the point, and every time you pass an X, it makes a prediction, gives you the Y value. Now, when we are dealing with classification, let's say you have two dimensions, X1 and X2. This is, this is, this is data set that you have. And this is class one. These points on the left are class zero. Your goal here is to find a line that separates these two classes from each other. Okay. And this line is theta transpose x equal to zero. We will get to that y best equation. But that's that's um, that's the line. That's what we want to find. So in order to solve a classification problem, you need to find this line. You have this line, then you can say that which class the point belongs. This line called decision boundary or decision line. Okay. So now, when we are talking about the discriminative classification, 
basically, this community classification is the type of classification that all it cares about is to find a line, okay, to simply just find a line and calculate this value just with respect to the line. You know, if you have a line, you look at and you calculate that value. That value is either positive or negative. If it's positive, that means you're up side of the line. If it's negative, you're under the line. Discriminative transmission, all it cares about is that a straightforward, you make a calculation and you have a line. If it's positive, you say it's class one, it's a negative, it should be class zero. So any classification that all it cares about is to find a line and with respect to the line, look at the positive and negatives just by calculating this term directly called discriminative classification. Okay. So any classification that calculate this term using a uh, basically naive based theorem becomes generative classification. So because it's naive based, that means this term is the posterior and this equal a likelihood times a prior. Right. So what's the likelihood is the, the reverse, basically, probability of x, given y equal to, and this is the prior. Right. Any classification algorithm that solves this problem by calculating this term becomes generative classification. Okay. Now, in both scenario, in any classification, the whole idea is that to find that line in any classification as well, neural network or support vector or whatever. If there's a line you need to find, that line will separate the points. In discriminative, you have the line, then you calculate this term. This term is a straight, like it's just one shot. And if it's either positive, you're above. If it's negative, you're below. In generative, in order to calculate this, this equation, you first calculate that, then you multiply it by the prior, then you see the value is either positive or negative. Then you decide as above or you are below the line. That's the main difference these two have. Now, let's say uh, we have this data set. And we are interested to see that what is the probability of y1, y2 through yn given x1 through xn, or probability of the data. We are interested to find that. And because and we said this is IID, we call what's the probability of uh, yi given x1. And we always say that anytime we are solving this problem, this is with respect to class of interest. Okay. This is the, that technically means this is equal to probability of y i in one given x i. So you have a data set. This data set is binary, it's either class one or class zero. And in order to find what is the probability of this total, this data set, what's the chance of this, you need to do this multiplication. But if you think about it, uh, there is a problem with this equation. Okay. So we said here that um, with respect to this uh, basic figure, if theta transpose xi is greater than zero, you return class one. If theta transpose xi is less than zero, you retain class zero. Okay? That's how we're going to solve it. It's either positive or negative. If it's zero, that's the line. That's, that's why we don't have this. So you're interested to calculate this term for with respect to class one. That means for each point, you have n points. For each point, you look, what is the probability this point belongs to class one? So how do you calculate that? You look at this term, right? Is either positive or negative. So that means that for some of the points, this is one, but for some point, this goes to zero, right? So you see what's the problem here? One, one times times, imagine n minus one of them is one, one of them is zero, this multiplication becomes zero. zero. So 
because we care, we, we solve this with respect to class zero, class one. So this multiplication, that, that means that every time of every data points we have should be class one exactly in order to dispose becomes one, otherwise becomes zero. Okay, so that's the first problem that general form of classification has, and we need to basically address it. No, we will we will come back to this. Bear with this. Keep this in mind. Now, again, so this is the overall way of formulating a classification. This is what we just wrote here. You have a data set, and this term is always happening. Doesn't matter what's the problem you are solving is either positive or negative. Now, we want to talk about the easy, the, the most uh, like the easiest classification it's called linear discriminative analysis no is this is not the correct term simplest that's the word. simplest classification or lda so lda is one of those classification techniques i think that's really uh Came to the game as like, way back in the days. Uh, the whole we will see that the whole idea behind this really swings forward. But it, it still is a really decent classifier. You know, it's still maybe outperform from so many of the classification that they are out there. Now, uh, linear discriminative analysis. So first, what type of classification would you say it is? The generative. Don't, don't fall for that term. That's a good question someone asked. So this is generative classification. Now, I don't know why they put the term discriminative in it, but so. Uh, so if it's generative, that means in order to calculate the probability of Y being K given X, you need to have probability of um, X given what Y. Is times a prior because it's generated. So you need to have a prior, you need to have a likelihood. Now, think about it. What is a prior? In classification, what's a prior, do you think? What's that? Training data. No, but what is a prior? Like, yeah, from the training data, what, 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 how would you define it? Sum of all the class interest by total number of rows in the data set. Correct. So for class K, you you look at your data set, how many cat data point I have is CAD divided by total. That's prior. So prior in classification is really easy to calculate. You just look at your data, simply calculate all the priors that you need, right? So you never have a problem in calculating this one. The likelihood term or the density term is where you have problems. Because you don't know that, and density, you know, density or likelihood comes from a distribution, right? So that means that there is some distribution which you are not aware of, it, right? So that means that there's some unknown distribution. You need to estimate that. So how would you estimate an unknown distribution? We already talked like maximum likelihood distribution is one technique, right? So you assume, like for example, you collect some data, amount, large amount of data, right? And then you are trying to solve for it by using MLB, finding the parameters that you are looking for. So that's one uh, approach to use some basically density estimation technique to find that density function. The second approach is to make an assumption, like you make one strong assumption that, okay, for this problem that I'm solving, I know this data comes from a Poisson distribution. I know this data comes from a Gaussian distribution. So anytime you have some unknown distribution, that's, those are the two approaches you can take. You either solve it for it using some estimation techniques, or you make an assumption. When I say make an assumption also, that doesn't mean that you, you can just make any assumption, right? You technically need to prove it mathematically that the assumption uh, is sound, right? So now in this, um, this equation in your uh, book is written as, This form just I'm just this is the same thing I'm just rewriting it so um, your if you're starting the book divided by uh, 
in the book, these two terms are the same because this is the likelihood, this is the prior. And you know, the Bayesian theorem, it has some that normalization factor, and that's the same normalization factor. So if you saw this term is the same. Now, when we are talking about the LDA, LDA is the, the classification that, the generative classification that has two assumptions. The first part is that in order to calculate the density term in LDA, we make a strong assumption that the density comes from a multivariate Gaussian. That's the first assumption that we make in uh, LDA. So P of X even Y equal K, this comes from a multivariate Gaussian with mean K and variance. So that's the first assumption that they made in the LDA paper. And again, they made the assumption, but they proved it also analytically that to prove this works. Now, what do you think is the dimension of mu? Right? So if you have multivariate Gaussian, you have D columns, you will have one mean per column, right? So this is, is D by one. What's the covariance matrix? D by D, right? So now, and the, this basically is, That's a multivariate Gaussian. Okay, yeah. so. Um, X1 and X. So we are saying that X1 and X2, they are coming from a multivariate Gaussian. What was the properties of multivariate Gaussian? One was that, so each of these dimension individually, they are a univariate Gaussian, right? That they have some mean, which you have the mean, and they have a variance, right? And together, if you project these points, they become multivariate Gaussian like this, which that becomes the covariance, right? So also remember the covariance, for, for example, the two by two is A, A, B, A, B, B, A, right? So now that's, that's just for a whole data set, correct? Right? In the problem that now we are solving in the classification, there is a little change over there. And is that, because you have two class, right? So you typically have two clusters of data. One is that, for example, this is class zero and this is class one. So, and if you think about it, what basically this means that if you have this data set and this data set is a table versus a chair uh, images, what you need to do is that first split the data to separate part. Now you have data of all shares, data of all tables. And then if you fit a Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian per class, right? You will have one like that and you will have one like that. You remember we, we had in the first class, we had this, uh, a mixture of Gaussians, right? If you have two Gaussians like this together, this is one Gaussian. And the larger Gaussian, this one, was basically some weighted sum of each of each individual uh, uh, basically Gaussian, right? That becomes mixture Gaussian. So in the scenarios like this, your data, so this is multivariate Gaussian, 
but this technically is a mixture of Gaussian. What what it calls because we have because it's classification. You have different Gaussian data distribution, and together is a mixture of Gaussian. Now, you're interested. Basically, find that line again that separates this from each other, right? Data transpose x equal zero. Now, let's talk about that line, decision line, decision boundary. If I ask you, hey, how would you describe, if I just give you this line, and I'm asking you that, how would you, in a lame language, describe that line? What would you say? Don't say the line that separates classes from each other, no. But what is the definition of this line? Right, but so let me rephrase my question. How would you, if I ask you that, how would you define this? No, it doesn't have means it's a line, right? Like, what is the definition of a normal any line? Finding two points. So, should be constant. Not two. Any points which are present so that you can get separated. The line is set of points that you connect them together, right? That's the line, right? So this decision, the decision line, decision boundary, is a line. That means these are technically are set of points. It's not that otherwise line doesn't mean have any meaning, right? Set of points you connect them together. So the definition of a set decision line or decision boundary in classification is set of points. That probability of belonging to both class are the same. Okay, that's the decision boundary. These points, they either could be class zero or class one. The zero point five, the probability of belonging to both class is the same. So set of points, basically, x and y set of points, that probability of x, um, <coughs> probability of y being class one given x is the same as probability of y being class zero given x. That becomes decision line. And that holds for all sort of classification that you want to solve. That always that line, that means that any point that in, on that line doesn't cannot belong to uh, any uh, any class, you know. And Remember, this should be the probabilities are the same, you know. So because this probability technically means 0 0.5, right? It should be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, because completion should go to 1. If you say probability is 0, then 1 becomes 0, the other one becomes 1. So it should be exactly 0 0.5. So, so all the points blank on this line is 0 0.5. Exactly. So that, because if it's 0 0.49 and 0 0.51, you choose this one. It should be exactly 0 0.5 to be equal. And it cannot be zero because probably on one class zero, the other class is zero, that's wrong. It should be one minus the other one becomes it's basically zero. neutral, it's not not exactly yes, that's, that's yeah. So probably of both class is the same. But that's the decision boundary. Now, what we want to do is that we want to use this definition, okay, to find. That decision boundary for LDA problem. Because we say that in any classification, doesn't matter generative, discriminative, your goal is to find a line, right? So we know that the definition of a decision boundary basically means that probability of this term should be probability of this, term, right? right? That's the term you want to solve. Now, in LDA, we know what's the probability of y being one given x. That comes from this times this, a likelihood times the prime, right? So it means that probability of uh, x being one, sorry, x, B, x given y being one times probability of y being one should be the same as probability of x even y equals zero. Okay. 
Now, so you know this is a multivariate Gaussian that comes from here. So this means one over two p over two. This is one. So that's the first term. For, uh, for the prior, I just use the same thing. Like a pi of one doesn't matter. Because that's, and this is equal to This term is multivariate Gaussian. That's I just wrote as a uh, pi, pi one, same multivariate Gaussian times pi zero. Right? So now, when we talked about LDA, we said the first assumption that LDA makes is your data, uh, the likelihood comes from a multivariate Gaussian. Now, there is a second assumption that LDA makes. Let's see here. Second assumption, basically. And LDA says that covariance of both class are the same. Okay. So, what's the meaning of covariance of two data that are the same? It means that the shape of the distribution is the same, right? Okay. So that doesn't mean that the data are the same. If you, if you have this two data set, the, the values are different, but exactly the shape is identical. Okay. So the second assumption that LDA does is that the covariance of these two class are the same. And now why did they make that assumption? And in LDA case, it's for simplicity, in order to be able to solve this equation. Because if you make an assumption the covariances are the same, this term and this term they cancel each other, right? Because the covariance, there is no longer covariance of one and zero. Those two terms are the same, right? So now, okay, first we get rid of these two terms. How would you simplify this equation? What would you do? Log, right? So you have point log to this. This becomes one over two. I'm sorry to drop the um, indices here. Log of distribution from side of summation. Make sense so far? So now what you need to do is obviously bring the equation to the other side. Um, so I'm actually before bringing the, the other side, I'm going to have to simplify this term. So in order to simplify this term, what should I do? I should apply the transpose in this in this equation and do a multiplication, right? So we have minus one over two, x transpose times covariance inverse times x. X transpose Aquarius inverse X minus one over two X transpose Aquarius inverse minus me, uh, uh, mu one. So it goes plus one over two X transpose Aquarius inverse mu one. Then this one times this one, it becomes positive times this times that it becomes plus 
one over two mu one transpose variance inverse x one. And this becomes a negative term because one is one over two mu one transpose variance inverse mu one plus log of p1. Now I want to also simplify this term to take it to the other side. The first thing is that, wait, does this make sense, this multiplication? So all I did, apply transpose to this term, becomes x transpose minus mu transpose, and multiply element-wise by this, by that. And expand it, it becomes that one, right? So. Then I have log of P1. I have log of P0 on the other side. If I bring it to this side, it becomes log of uh, P1 minus log of P0. So the technique is log of P1 over P0, right? So it becomes plus log of P1 over P0. And then now this term, I have this term left. So I will. Do a multiplication and I take it to the other side. Basically, we will add a multiplied by another negative one. So, first, this becomes transpose, becomes a negative, negative, negative. Okay, it's a negative. When it goes to the other side, it becomes a positive. So, this is plus one over two x transpose variance inverse x. Then, this is a negative as a uh, Make another negative becomes positive when it goes to the other side becomes negative minus one over two x transpose variance inverse mu zero and this is negative negative positive positive goes to the other side becomes negative minus one over two mu zero transpose variance inverse x uh, negative positive negative that's right positive one over two mu zero that minus inverse mu zero right and this is equal to equal to zero because we took everything to the other side of the equation so now what we want to also focus at first actually we can do well this term and this term they are exactly the same one is negative, one is positive, right? Because X doesn't have any indices. Uh, so the, the second thing is that if you are looking at these terms, this term and this term are the same, right? One of them is transpose of the other, right? We have seen similar to this before. So we can just basically use both together. So this becomes, let uh, me write it up here. That becomes uh, x transpose mu. Again, this term and this term are the same term. Right. Uh, minus one over two mu one transpose variance inverse mu one plus log. Here also the same. These two terms are the same. This one and this one. If you apply transpose on either, it gives you the other one, right? So this becomes uh, minus x transpose zero. We have plus one over two mu zero. I should have a transpose mu zero transpose. You guys should look at that too. Be sure that. 
follow what's happening. So now, does this make sense? So yes, that's a no. Why such a quiet class? Okay. So now we're going to simplify this. This term and this term they have x transpose in common. We can say x transpose times variance inverse u one minus variance inverse u zero. Then these two term. Uh, I think you all they have in common is a minus over one over two. This was u transpose times u, and then plus that log one power of u zero equal to zero. What does this remind you of? What or what could you say about that equation? This is sort of the dimension. What is the dimension of this multiplication? D by one, right? D by one minus D by one to D by one. Right. So whatever is coming out of here is D by one. And is this D by one? So also you agree this is, when you say d by one this this is a, a scalar vector right you have multiplying your covariance by mean it gives you some a scalar vector right so here also um, what's the dimension here so we have one by d d by d that's one by d times d by one one by one right so this is an a scalar technique right so it's one by one. And this is also in a scalar. So what does this remind you of? X times a vector and a scalar vector minus some basically constant. Some constant. Right. 8x plus b equals zero. What's that? It's the equation of the line, right? X is your data point, your vector, right? You already have these terms like the covariance and the mean. You multiply your data point by some scalar vector minus some constant value equal to zero. And that's the decision boundary. And that's, that's how we solved for it, right? In order to reach this equation, what did we do? We wrote set of points that the probability of both class were equal, right? We say the probability of y being one given x is the same as probability of y being zero given x. Then we said in LDA, you calculate this probability because it's generated as likelihood times prior. Likelihood times prior equal likelihood times prior for class, class one and class zero. Then we expand it. We made a second assumption that the covariances were the same. So you get rid of some of the uh, basic indices, covariance indices, and we just expand this term, that multiplication. And we took everything to the other side of the line. After you simplify it, all you reach is the equation of a line. Right? That's what we call linear discriminative analysis. The, the decision bond, decision boundary or decision line is simply a linear line. Okay. Does that make sense? So this is LDA, and this is like one of the simplest classifiers. Um, now, there is a second. Well, uh, basically, um, this primitive analysis model called quadratic 
Analysis. U D A. As the term quadratic comes, that means that the decision boundary decision uh, boundary is no longer a straight line, right? So it should be basically some sort of quadratic decision boundary, right? So now in Q D A, the first the first assumption is still there. You know, uh, that means that the probability of x given y equal a comes from the Gaussian with multivariate Gaussian. This first assumption is still the same. You assume that your likelihood comes from a multivariate Gaussian. However, we relax uh, the second assumption, basically. That means covariance of class one is not the same as variance of as zero. So now you're basically when you want to solve for this, you need you, the way that you're looking at is that okay, in order to solve this problem now, I need to do the same thing. I need to solve for the decision boundary by finding this term. Right? And this term is a likelihood times prior. Previously, when we tried to simplify it, we said the covariance are the same, so we got rid of one part of the equation. But this time, if you solve this, I will leave this one to yourself. You cannot get rid of that the first part. So when you apply log, it becomes log of one minus log of two p plus uh, minus log of uh, covariance one over two. That's the only term is going to be added. And if you simplify it, at the end, you're going to reach uh, AX2 plus BX plus C equal to zero. First one, because we get rid of the covariance, becomes a, become a linear line. The second one, you will end up with a, a basically quadratic term. That's why it becomes a QDA. You know? So I will leave that, that one to yourself to simplify. Now, in both scenario, we said the first, uh, basically the first step in classification is that you find that decision boundary. Because if you have the decision boundary, you can, be, with respect to that, you can say if the point is class zero or class one, right? So assuming that, okay, we have the decision line. Now in the next step is that, okay, for a given point, this is the say this is a, Test data point. You want to see what is the chance this test point belongs to a class K, right? So now you have the decision line, and for all test point or train for any point, basically, you want to say what's the chance this belongs to a class K. And this is still the same, right? So we find Y being K as times probability of Y being K, right? And in order to solve it, to simplify it, we actually, in, in, even in the prediction, we apply log to this term. We're basically going to solve um, log of um, so going to be log of one minus log of minus log of. And that log and they cancel each other. And then there is a term log of pk. Right? If I apply log with this term, that's what I get. The first one is a multivariate Gaussian. I apply the log to it. The second one is a, just a prior, right? So in order to make a prediction for any any points, you calculate this value. Now, let's go back to LDA first. So, in LDA, when we wanted to find the decision line, 
we said, okay, the covariances are the same, right? So we, we got to it, the equation of the line. But for the, in the prediction step, we have a covariance term. You need to have a value for that, right? So in LDA, when we want to solve the prediction, we assume that the covariance is just identity matrix, right? Just assume the covariance is identity matrix one, basically. If you put one here, so this term goes to zero, basically, right? Uh, so this one, basically log of one also goes to zero, right? Wait, this is one. Inverse of one, that's also just one, right? So this term basically becomes minus log of this d can comes behind this minus log of minus one over two. Right. So in LDA, when we want to make that prediction, we first because we already made the assumption the covariances are the same. So how that means that the covariance shouldn't have any impact in the classification. So we want to get rid of it. The easiest way is that to put the covariance as identity matrix. So all the terms will disappear, right? So now let's look at this term. This is probability of y being in class and x. Anyone tell me that what do you think is the is is this term positive or negative? Solve it for any value. Negative, right? So now, in if you think if you look at here, this term doesn't matter for which class you are solving; it's the same for all classes, right? It's just these the dimensions; it's the same for all classes. So you can basically get rid of that in, in your calculation, right? It's, it's a it's a constant that exists for any class that you are solving. The only terms that are changing are this term, this, this part, right? Which the first one is a negative, is always a negative term. And the second one is a log of probability. What was the shape of the log? This is P. What's log of P? Right, so it's from here to here, right? Zero to one. So log is always negative. Doesn't matter what's the probability. So that term is always a negative itself, right? So when you are calculating this, right? It's it's giving you a negative value, correct? So now let, let's try to break it down, see what, what's the meaning of that. So we have class zero, we have class one, okay? So, in when we were talking about the decision boundary, and actually, when we were talking about the decision boundary, I said our goal is that to find this decision boundary, right? But for in the discriminative classification, you simply calculate a value and you say if it's positive or negative, you make a decision, right? LDA is a generative classification, right? I said it's no longer like that. You basically, in order to find the value, you multiply the prior times the likelihood. Okay. Now, let's look at what's the impact here. We have two points, we have two class. No. Class one, class zero. That's the mean of the two class. Imagine like in the 2D scenario. This is one new data point will come here, X test. And you are interested to see which point this belongs to. Based on the probability concept here, this equation, 
what you need to do is that. So what does this term remind you? X minus mean transpose times X minus mean. Right, Euclidean distance, right? So you simply, you have the means for each class and it's D by one, right? These are D by one. This is D by one. Your input also is D by one, right? So you do po points minus mean, right? Centralize them and times dot product. So that gives you Euclidean distance, right? So this becomes, uh, let's say, uh, distance two, distance one. And you have two distances. But it tells you in order, if, if, we, if we just ignore the formula and we, are, we have a distance and you want to make a classification, you would have said the one that has, has a lower distance, which belongs to that, right? But in the generative, we don't stop there. We have that log of prior. The log of prior, so let's make an example. Let's say um, you have a prior for a cat, prior for a cat is 0 0.4, prior for a dog is 0 0.6, okay? And this is cat is dog. And you, you get one new point, okay? And you calculate this Euclidean distance, and you find out, let's say, the Euclidean distance for this side is minus 0 0.3, and this side is minus 0. Point, uh, the distance is not minus, it has a minus behind it, but that's what I mean. So minus 0 0.6, okay? But one of them is further. Again, the minus comes from this term, otherwise the distance is positive. Now, this LDA or generative approach tells you that in order to not make a decision, sum this term plus log of the prior, right? Can, can using your calcul calculator tell me what's the log of 0.4 and log of 0 0.6? Minus 0 0.39 and the other one? So now you need to sum these two values, right? So minus one over two times this becomes minus, uh, basically becomes uh, this value minus 0 0.39. And this is minus 0 0.454, right? And the other one is minus 0 0.3, minus 0 0.22, minus 0, minus 0 0.52, right? So you're trying to find it is a distance, right? So if, which one of this is closer? The technique is this one, right? So when you want to pick the value, now you are going to pick the dog because based on the distance for that one data point, you are closer to this. But generative probably tells you that don't just look at the distance, look at the prior. What is actually the chance being dog based on the data and versus cat? So see the generative probability, first you have you find the likelihood, then you look at the prior and then you make a decision. In discriminative, we will see, we don't have this. We only calculate the likelihood, which is, for example, the distance, and we make a decision based on that. We, we don't care about the prior concept. Is that clear? Okay, so, now, so this was for LDA, that became the line. Now, in, um, when you are working with QDA, because we don't have the, like we cannot just drop the covariance anymore. So you need to calculate the covariances. So uh, let's say covariance of class K, this is one over NK summation of I minus. <laughs> Uh, 
Right, that's that's the uh, if you estimate the covariance for each class, there's this multivariate Gaussian, and then for mean, basically you will have uh, simply just take the average of points combination of xi over k, where i is. Uh, If you simply for mean, you average the points that belong to class K, and that becomes the mean of each class, right? For covariance, you need to cut, and this is for I, where points belong to class K, not for all points. So in QD, you need to, and again, this equation is comes from your book. You know, the, that's the equation for the covariance and mean of multivariate. And that's a bias estimate of the covariance also. But anyway. So you have this suit and the prior is simply basically uh, summation of uh, points uh, over the total data points that you have, uh, where I, that becomes the prior, right? You count how many, because when we say summation, because uh, it's actually other than summation, because if you have it for multi, uh, class classification, we just say nk over n. Number of point in class k divided by total points. That becomes the prior. So in QDA, you have these three terms. So if you want to calculate this equation, you cannot just get rid of this term anymore or this term, because now you have a covariance. So you need to actually use that covariance to make a prediction. So remember that one. So the same equation, but then you cannot just drop the covariance uh, matrices. You need to use the value that you have found. That becomes QD in the prediction step. Now, the there is one, you know, there is one special case in uh, QDA, and in that special case, rather than using so many covariances, they do an average covariance, and they, in the prediction step, and they want to use that. Okay, so the average covariance basically we do summation n r covariance r r from one to k summation of n r. Because you simply multiply each covariance by how many points was in that covariance in that class, you sum this and then average this, and it gives you one average covariance. And you use that in your Classification. So that's a special case of QDA, but remember that you might have questions like, like a formula given and ask you that to calculate something like that. Uh, question. So this is LDA and QDA, and this is like again the simplest one of one of the simplest classifiers because the idea behind it is really straightforward. You just find a decision line with respect to gap multivariate Gaussian. In one scenario, you get rid of the covariances, you assume they are the same. In the other scenario, you need to calculate this. One of them, the line becomes linear, the other one becomes the quadratic line. Question? Okay, so. Now, can you give an example of a data set where we can apply this or uh, the quadratic one? Uh, I will not give an example, but you guys need to solve it. Uh, I gave this example, I think this was um, last semester's question. So last semester, I'm going to tell you how was the exam, so in case you want to practice. I give you one data set in your, in your exam, like 10 data points, 12 data points, 20 data points. And I give random questions, like one of them is linear regression, one of them is uh, LDA, one is QDA, one is logistic regression. And randomly, each of you get one of those. So that's the whole idea. So a lot of the students are like, I didn't practice this one. I didn't set up. That's on you. You need to know all those. This, we are going to learn for midterm six uh, algorithm: the linear QDA, LDA, logistic regression, naive base, and then there's another one classification. So you need to basically be able to even in one data set solve it manually. You know that's uh, that's all I'm telling you. That's your question is going to be exactly like that. So don't come to exam and say that I read. Linear regression, I forgot neighbors. No, I'm already telling you that you need to know all six. 
and you need to be able to solve. It. Start practicing. If you have a question, then come to us. I'm not going to give a question to go solve. You can, internet is full of data set. You can generate a random data set and just simply manually solve it. So, okay. Now, we want to go back now to the problem that we were talking about. So we, so we were talking about that, okay, in general form of classification, because we care about the probability of, uh, so right now this is what we saw, we were predicting for one data, X test, right? You see that we calculate that here. But in general form, we say, uh, if this is the, if this is the decision line, right? Uh, when I say general form, right now, we're talking about, sorry, discriminative form. In, in discriminative form, you have a decision line and you care about you either this side of the line or you are the other side of the line, right? So if you are this side of the line, this, ter this term is positive. If you are this side of the line, this term is negative. And if you're on the line, it's zero, right? And if we want to formulate that, basically, we will say that if this value is greater than zero, y is one. If this value is greater than less than zero, y is zero. And so because of this, if someone asks me that, OK, hey, what is the probability of uh, this data set given this input, right? Plus zero again, IID. This becomes multiplication of individual. And then why I given XI. And because we are saying that we care about class one, that means you're solving this with respect to class one. And we know that if point belongs to the other class, right? The probability of class one goes to zero. So that equation, that multiplication becomes zero, right? So that, that's a problem. Uh, that means that when we want to make a classification, we shouldn't be really strict. We shouldn't say that if you are this side of the line, you are this class. If you are the other side of the line, you are the other class, right? We shouldn't be that sure about our prediction. Now, the uh, solution that we start to apply here was that, okay, you know, we have these points right, for both class. But how would you guarantee that if the point is here, actually belongs to class one. This is class one, this is class zero. How would you guarantee this point belongs to class one? It's the other side of the line, correct? But how sure are you, right? So here we are, we, we are answering it by just being really sure. I'm sure if it's positive, it's class one. And we saw that cause a problem, right? That can cause a problem. So what, what, would, what should we do? What we are going to do is that we are going to Apply a specific function on the points. So this is the distance, theta transpose x, right? It's either positive from the line or negative under the line. So we are going to apply a function that as the distance increases, the output of that function increase. As the distance decreases, the output of the function decrease. We're going to basically apply a function that is with respect to a distance. That means if you're closer to the line, you're closer, we're going to give you a lower value. That means I'm not that confident. If you're further away from the line, doesn't matter this way or this way, it gives you a higher value. What function would you think that can give you that? It's not log. Think about this, all the simple functions that we have in algebra. What function do you think? is increasing if the value increases. Let's see with this binary. Exponential, right? This basically E, if this is, I don't know, if, if this is like, let's say P, that's E of P, right? So as it increases, it gives you the larger value, right? So, we know that if we apply E over the distance, as the value of distance increases, or that's because we are further away from the line, 
is going to give us a larger value, more confidence. And it, as we're closer to the line, as you, we get closer to the line, the value is going to be smaller. So first thing we're going to do is that we're going to apply E to this term, to this equation. We're going to, let's say, apply, apply E. So this becomes E to the power of theta transpose X, E to the power of, um, so this becomes negative theta transpose X. In order for mass simplicity and also for in order to sum properly, we're going to add one over two theta transpose x and this one over two theta transpose x. So the first again, one over two is just because we want to sum of this two e to be the same, uh, to, to sum uh, complete each other. And negative is because one of them is the negative side. You know, the other one, this one has a negative distance. You multiply it by a negative, right? The other one has a positive distance, so it doesn't need that negative term. Now, okay, so now we are saying that if for this term, for class one, for, for this term for class zero, but we, and we say that we are going to use this E to give us some confidence. Confidence is some probability technique, right? But this term is not a probability. How would you convert these two terms to a probability? If you have two terms, how would you make it a probability? Divide by total, right? So all you need to do is that basically, let's say define one over Z, E theta transpose X and one over Z, E minus theta transpose X. And you define Z to be basically summation of these two. Now, now you are sure this is a probability. That means that every time you pass to this equation right now, a, a value, uh, and says that, hey, which class this belongs to, it doesn't give you one or zero, it gives you a probability. I'm 60% sure this is class one. And class zero becomes one minus 60%, is 40%, right? So the, the you basically, this type of model, the allow you to make a decision. Okay, if, well, we're gonna get back to you. Let me first write this, and I'm gonna see what that decision means. Probability of y being class one, given x, that's equal uh, one over z. And probability of y being class zero, given x, So, when I say um, your model, I mean, the model this way allows you to make a decision, uh, think about this way. So you're making a prediction and you have this model that this model is uh, for each point is going to give you what's the probability this point belongs to class one, not class zero, because we always predict with respect to class one. So, point, like you, I have this table, and this is points, this I have one dimension, x, and this is y hat, what I'm going to predict. And actually, let me rephrase the y hat to be probability of y being class one, given x. Right, we have all these data points. We pass it to this model, this equation, and we already, this is assuming that we already have found that theta, okay? That we, this theta we, have, we haven't got to that point. Let's assume that you have the theta, you have this model right now. For each data point, you pass it to the model, it gives you value. One, 0 0.2, 0 0.0001, and so on. It gives you value. If the prob so probability, higher the probability, that means you actually belong to class one, lower the probability means you don't belong to class one, right? So the benefit of such a model is that, you know, by default, how would you decide which point should, belongs to class one actually, if you are having these values? How would you decide that threshold? Threshold, uh, maybe go 0.5. That's, that, that's, like a, that's like a really intuitive scenario, right? 0.5. So 
you decide any, you, you find a cutoff anytime is above one, you say one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, right? That's kind of like a really basically intuitive approach, like a naive approach. When you have these scenarios that you have these probabilities, something that we're going to learn is called sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis means that you are looking at the values that your model predicting. Okay, so let's say I have this model, and and my model, if this is the probability value, okay, um, or actually, let's say if this is uh, x, this is the probability, right? So, um, I feel this way. If this is P, this is the frequency, frequency, right? So probably this is start here, let's say from zero, let's, let's say I created these beans, right? 0 0.2 all the way to 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and one. I created these beans like by uh, incre incrementing by 0 0.1 or 10, basically. And I make a prediction over all my training data, so I have, 1 million training data after I finished the learning, I pass all 1 million to the model and says that what is the probability of going to class one for each? Then I create this frequency count. Now I have a lot here. I have some here. I have some here increasing, which is 0 0.5. Maybe I have a couple of here. Then I have a lot here. I have a lot here. This is technically what it is going to look like. Now, when you are looking at something like this, first thing is that you always want your model to not to be too confident. What does that mean? A confident model is that the model that always really sharply predicts around zero or predicts around one. You don't want the model to be that confident. You want the model to have a distribution you know, that gives you value 0 0.6, 0 0.7, you know, something like that. Over a confident model, it causes problem in prediction. In the reality, when you're sending it outside, when your model is overconfident, it always either says 90% and like class one or 0% class zero. It doesn't give you uh, basically an option to make a decision. And what's that decision mean? So we are looking at this line, and then you also, let's say it's like you're doing some. Uh, visualization, you also color it for class one versus class zero. Now you have these colors, right? You will see here, for example, uh, this part, are class, those points belongs to class zero and you made a mistake, right? And the rest is class one. And um, you will see, actually, let's, let's raise it. There's no class one here, but you will see there are some class one points here, and there are some class one here, and there are some class zero. Is the darkest class zero, and there, this empty one is class one. So there's no class zero in here. Now, by default, when you want to define that threshold, you would have say zero point five. Anything this side, you will say class one, and the other side, you say class. Zero. But depending on the problem that you have, so an example for you is that in my field of work, we do cybersecurity, like uh, we deal with threats, right? So it's like in and in a bigger system like a hospital environment, that if attack happens, you need to be really precise on stopping before the whole network goes. So we have these models that you know imagine the doing the threat detection, and we need to mitigate. This calls mitigate to stop the threat. That means to block everything to isolate the whole network. But think about it. If we make a mistake, we think there was an attack, and it's not actually an attack. You shut down the whole system, and that's really cost. You know, it's because think about it, it's a hospital, it's not a school that you can shut it down, right? So we need to be really sure about when to call, when to stop. So we do something like this, sensitivity analysis, then we are looking at the actual data and we see that I, there is a chance I make a mistake here. There's a chance I make a mistake here. Why don't make a mistake here? So I will actually go pick up my cutoff value there. So you look this whole sensitive analysis, you look at the prediction of your model, see that where the that where the model makes more mistakes. And depending on what is more important for you, you know. So 
in my case, in our case, we care about to detect correctly, but we also care to not call user fatty. You know, if you keep making alerts and the user is like, a, have you heard that the story that, that, that guy, the shepherd guy keep calling wolf? And then, so if you keep doing that, at some point when you see wolf, the user doesn't care. That's called user fatigue in, in, in the software. Uh, so you don't want to keep alert to your user and then they, they got tired of it. So you try to be really slick. So, okay, then that question is that, so what would you do to this point? You know, there might be actually an attack or something. Yes, yeah, so you still do something about it. You don't stop it. You directly call, basically there's a system like a messaging system. You contact the hospital and say, that, hey, something like this, I'm not 100% sure on it, but it's dangerous, take a look. So you give it, let the IT know, so they go basically uh, look into it. So that's why this concept of probability is actually important for you. Now, by converting from this system to a probability system, you not only, you are saying that, you know, here we were saying short, yes or no, but now you have, you, first you are saying that probability, but also that probability gives you an option to do sensitivity analysis. Okay, so this concept is really important. Remember that. Now, okay. Uh, let me go into this. Find it out here. So I'm going to just write this term with respect to class one now. Probability of class one given x. We said this was equal. 1 over z uh, e to the power of 1 over 2 data transpose x. So then z is basically this one plus the other one. So this is 1 over 2 data transpose x over data transpose x plus e to the power of minus data transpose x, correct? So now, simplify this, so this becomes uh, right. Just extracted that term from, okay. Now I can cancel this too. Who knows what's that function? What's the function? The sigmoid function, right? It's a sigmoid function. And now what do you think is this classification? Logistic regression, right? Is it, the way that we basically develop logistic regression was that to formulate the simplest scenario for classification, the decision line, if you're up or down, you're class one or class zero. And to just avoid being so sure, we applied an E to it by just simply applying an E function and normalizing it to be, become a probability that becomes a logistic regression. Make sense? So this is also, you will see it this way. Um, okay, data x, so sigmoid of a value is one over one plus e to the power of Remember that uh, this type of equations, these are something that you actually need to memorize it for your whenever, as data scientists, data analysts, machine learning engineer. You need to the sub function like sigmoid function, uh, softmax. You need to know the formula by heart. You know, those are uh, straightforward. You know, can figure it out. Okay, so this becomes a sigmoid function, and this becomes a logistic regression. Now. We haven't solved for logistic regression yet. We just formulate. We just formulate. Okay, the probability of let me actually write behind the probability of y being class one given x equal a sigmoid function. What do you think the probability of y being class zero is? One minus that. One minus this term. This technically this becomes a positive. That becomes the probability of class zero. So we will uh, we'll continue on this one in the next class. But uh, what we want to do in the next class is basically 
Now you have the probability, right? Do you remember we, we said this term, the probability of y being one when x out of one and right? Previously, this multiplication would have gone to zero if you have one mistake, right? But now you have this sigmoid term, right? So also, also let, let, me, let, me, let me point out something here. So when I say we care about class um, class one, I from one to n, even if you write this just with respect to um, k, uh, x, and k is minor. Even if you don't write it only with respect to class one, if we write it with respect to both class. Look at this multiplication. For a given point, suppose your points, right? X and Y, one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, something. That's the first one. The point belongs to class one. You would have said, what's the probability that's class one? And let's say your model said correctly one. That's one times. But the next one also your model said correctly one times one. For this one also, you're asking the model what's the probability of being class zero. The model correctly says one, right? So it's still one. But if you make one mistake, that means that you one point, you it belongs to class one, you say it's class zero. Or it's class zero, you say class one, this term goes to zero. You see, it doesn't matter how you write it with respect to class one or with respect to total, one mistake is overall goes to zero. But now we're going to use this term. It's because it's probability, so it doesn't basically push it towards zero, right? And you can see, you can guess how we're going to solve it. Apply log, I assume like the summation, find the theta. That's the next step, basically. Okay. Uh, if we stop here, we're going to have lab. Uh,